Hello, everyone. Whoa, that's loud. Um, thank you for uh, coming in this evening. Uh, and it's, uh, it's amazing we have so many people here interested in hardware at the software conference. Um, I know we had to bribe some folks to, to get the uh, pres presentation um, even included in the voting because they kept saying, wait a minute, this is OpenStack. What, what's hardware got to do with any of this stuff? So um, somehow we got in and America voted us in. Thank you. Um, my name is Jay Hendrickson. I'm a product manager at Hewlett Packard. And Steve Collins um, couldn't make it, um, so um, you're going to be stuck with the marketing guy. Uh, so let me just say that before I get moving, probably everything I say is somewhat of a lie. Um, <laughs> um, I've got 217 slides I'm going to show you because that's what we do in marketing. They're all color and they're very um, much of an eyesore. But uh, you know, let me let me get to something serious here. So. Um, about a year ago, we decided that we would design a private cloud and sort of put it into a box. And uh, um, it, 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 months and months of talking with um, HP public cloud operators, um, talking with customers. In fact, we even got a customer to help us design the hardware. Um, uh, and so it, it was really good, but it took a long time. When we first thought of this, we thought, OK, let's put a, a, an OpenStack cloud in a rack and we'll just throw some hardware in there, and, and it should be fine. And it, and it turns out that that's not the case. It took us months and months and months um, to come up with a, uh, with a, a, a set of hardware that, that can do the work um, for, for, for an OpenStack private cloud. So one of the things that I want to kind of start out with is this is a design, a hardware design, for a private cloud. Uh, Everybody in here is going to have their own opinion about how that works. Um, this, is, this is one of them. Um, a couple of caveats on, how we, uh, on, on why we designed it the way we did. Um, it, it, uh, um, it, it, it's, it's designing your, your first OpenStack private cloud. So, so for enterprise customers who are interested in standing up their first OpenStack private cloud, as we go through the design phase of this, um, keep, kind of keep that in mind. I mean, obviously, if you're adding on to your OpenStack cloud, uh, if you've got racks and racks and racks in multiple data centers, your design would be somewhat different than this. So kind of keep that in mind. So uh, this is the agenda. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the case for a private cloud. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. We need a private cloud. Rapid provisioning of resources makes things go faster. The compliance issues, the security issue, perceived security issues that, that we talk about, performance issues, I think we all kind of get it that a private cloud is somewhat um, necessary in today's, um, in today's IT world and certainly going to become more necessary as we, as we, as we go forward. Um, then I'm going to talk about uh, some of the workloads that we were thinking about, the use cases that we were thinking about um, as we design this, because the design has to do a little bit with workloads. And, um, and then I'm going to talk about, okay, what's your plan when you do this? And then I'm going to show you what we did. So without further ado, let's, um, let's talk about the work case, the, the, the use cases. So again, first private OpenStack cloud. So as you think about it, uh, I mean, it would be nice to just say, all right, let's put in, our, let's design a private cloud. We're just going to throw a bunch of hardware together. We're going to put it in the data center, and we're going to dump all of the cloud native applications that we already have onto the cloud in Presto. And that's, that's usually not how it's going to work. Um, and the assumption here is that isn't how it's going to work. So the use cases I'm going to talk about are, uh, you're going to want a cloud that, um, that you're going to use to design cloud native applications. You may want your private cloud to help you with basic dev test uh, work. And then finally, when it all gets done, you're actually going to host these cloud native applications on your, on your private cloud. So uh, we sort of looked at it from that way of, of this, this cloud that you build, it's not going to be a proof of concept. It's going to be something that you can use. You can get your OpenStack wings, if you will. 
you can start working with it, you can start having multiple users using it, and as that happens, you grow. So that's kind of the, the, the use cases that we're gonna talk about. So, um, what's the plan? So you're gonna design the hardware stack, what's the plan? Well first, what OpenStack distro do you wanna use? Do you wanna go to the OpenStack Foundation and download all the bits yourself? put them all together, a couple months later, maybe get it installed, have it running? Do you want to use a, a commercial distribution of OpenStack? Lots of them, right? Red Hat has one, HP has one, Canonical has one, Suse has one, my dog has one. Um, I mean, there's, there's, there's tons of them. So you, you, you need to make that decision um, up front. Then the second thing is you really do need to realize that it's it's complex to architect this. And one thing, um, and I keep bringing this back up because uh, it, we, we are talking about the very specific first OpenStack cloud. There's a lot of probably general thought processes that say, I know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna look around at what the public cloud providers have and I'm gonna use the same hardware they use. They know what they're doing. They've been doing it for a while. But, but it's not that simple because a uh, public cloud provider has multiple, multiple data centers, racks and racks and racks and racks of servers, and when, when a server goes down, you rip and replace and off you go, and they have all that OpenStack expertise. If you're building your first OpenStack private cloud, you may not have all of that OpenStack expertise. It is complicated. And worrying about hardware uh, it is, is a real concern. So it, it is somewhat complicated, and that's, and that's why we're gonna talk about some of these things. The other thing is, um, you need to expect that your workloads are going to change. So traditional IT, virtualized environment, you have workloads, users, dial up, email, whatever, ask for VMs to be stood up, ask for servers to be stood up, ask for this, ask for that, and those, those are certain behaviors, but boy, once, uh, once provisioning starts happening on demand, the behaviors will change and your workloads will change. So when we talked with our public cloud operators uh, um, for, the, uh, for the HP public cloud, uh, one of the questions I asked was, well, you know, what, what do the customers come to you with? And, and by far, the, the, I mean, the answer was, we have customers, they come in, they say, we have these sets of work, workloads, we have these sets of use cases, and it turns out they had no idea because things changed. So you don't know what you don't know. And that's important when you're designing your, your hardware because you're gonna need hardware that is somewhat flexible. You're gonna need to um, expect to scale up and to scale out. You're, you're not gonna go in and say, okay, I wanna buy a data center full of rip and replace hardware. You're, you're gonna start out, you're gonna start out maybe a rack of servers and you're going to uh, put some Swift, put some uh, Cinder, put some compute, all that stuff. And, and as, your, as the various users start increasing, and they will, uh, you'll need to scale up and out. So that's important. The other thing you need to do is to, is to mitigate risk. And when I say that, what I mean is, um, and when you put your badge down in front of the CIO and say, I want to spend half a million dollars to, for a science project that is going to take us on this journey, uh, you, you kind of want to sort of reduce the amount of risk that you're dealing with. So uh, I would suggest that you, you get reliable hardware uh, because you don't want to be messing around with hardware issues while you're learning your OpenStack private cloud uh, work use cases and, and all of that. So, um, so you wanna do that. You, you also, uh, you wanna make that hardware, you wanna get hardware that is easily managed. So you're gonna be spending a lot of time getting, getting your OpenStack wings, getting this private cloud up and running, putting on all the other management utilities that you put on top of it. Uh, and, and so managing the hardware um, you want that to be kind of secondary and a no-brainer. So, something else. And then finally, how much time do you have? Uh, do, do you, uh, you wanna start out with, uh, with 
you know, kind of a contraption of hardware laying around that seems to kind of work and then start playing around with it? Or do you want, or do you want to have maybe something delivered or something about what I'm about to talk about, which is some sort of a recipe of what you can, of what you can do? So those, these are some of the things that I want you to think about, and I'm going to get right to the heart of the matter now. So again, we, we, uh, we, sp we spent so much time, uh, again, talking with all these folks about what is it, how do you do this? How do you do this? And so I'm just going to show you what we did. This is an example. Um, and it, it's, uh, it's, it's based on the um, HP Helion OpenStack distribution. Um, the key here is uh, the compute nodes, the Swift nodes, the, um, the Cinder nodes, um, they're, they're pretty much OK with any distribution. And so you're going to see some of the management control plane. Some, these are some of the things that you want to think about. So what we did was keeping in mind that the workloads were going to change. You're not going to know what they are. We wanted to use some platforms that were extremely flexible, extremely reliable, extremely um, easy to manage, and, and, and could easily be reprovisioned if and when needed. In other words, we know what our control plane is for Helion OpenStack. We also know that as OpenStack grows, so will the management control plane. It will change. And so you want to have a control plane where as servers reduce in number, you can reprovision them to do other things. So this is what we have here. Uh, if you're not familiar with, uh, with HP hardware, let me kind of give you a, a um, ProLiant 101. Um, the, the two models that we're using are DL360s and DL380 Generation 9 platforms. They have the same architecture. The 360s are 1U, the 380s are 2U, but they have the same architecture. Same motherboard, same processors, same memory. Uh, the difference is that there are a, little more, a few more PCI buses on the 2U unit, the 380, and the 380 can handle uh, more storage. The reason we chose those is because same architecture, easy to manage. So we can use HP OneView. You could use what your management software of choice, and you're managing the same architecture. So when it's time to uh, when it's time to to uh, change drivers, you know, spin firmware, those kinds of things, it's on all the nodes in the in the box. It makes it a little bit simpler. Um, so I'm going to talk about the the uh, management control plane last. I want to kind of talk about the compute, the Swift, and the Cinder nodes first. So for compute nodes, we use DL360s, 1U, and, and we wanted them as dense as we could get. So we used Haswell 18-core processors. So each one of these nodes has 36 cores. We put 256 gig uh, in, the, in the platform using 16 gig DDR4 RAM. Uh, there's room for an additional uh, memory to go up to 384 using these 16 gig DIMMs. Um, if, you, if you have some money and you want to throw in 32 gig DIMMs, you can go up to over 700 gig of memory. And we thought this is a nice thing to do. We want to, uh, you know, when you think about power and cooling and all of the things that, that go on, go, go on in, in hardware, you want to make your compute as dense as possible just to kind of keep that rack size as small as possible. So we put four of those in, in the platform. Um, we have four 1.2 terabyte drives, SAS drives in, in these, um, and that's to take care of the, the OS as well as ephemeral storage. So pretty, pretty straightforward compute node. Uh, as thing, you know, if you want to add more memory, obviously you can do that uh, as, as OpenStack changes and you can, you can begin to use uh, block storage across all of these compute nodes and you know, various things. Um, you, can, you can even add more storage. But that's, that's what we use to, to, to start with. For our Swift, uh, again, first OpenStack private cloud. So for our Swift nodes, we use DL380s. We only use two. Now, I know Swift is you know, replication of three, but we only use two. And we, we did that mostly for cost. Later on, you want to start adding more stuff, you can, but we want to do it for cost. Again, it's your first OpenStack private cloud. Well, now we stuffed the, the DL380s with, um, with 15 drives. 13 of them are six terabyte large form factor drives. We did that because object storage 
Uh, you're not necessarily looking for performance, you're looking for capacity. So we put these six terabyte drives. So each one of these Swift nodes has 78 terabytes of usable storage. So it's, a, it, it's, a, it, it's going to allow you for your, uh, for your glance images, and it will also allow you for some for, for object storage, uh, you know, in addition to the basic um, OpenStack uh, management system. Um, Cinder. So for, for block storage, again, we use, we use DL380s. This time, we, uh, we use small form factor drives because we were interested in speed. And so uh, the, uh, the small form factor, oh, let me back one second. The, the, for the Swift, we have 13 of the six terabyte drives. And then for the OS, uh, we, we use um, two 600 gig drives. Okay, so to Cinder. So for Cinder, we use small form factor drives. They're faster. Uh, they're uh, 1.2 terabyte drives. The, now, the, the, when you use small form factor drives in the DL380 Gen 9, uh, you, can, you can have up to 26 drives. So we put in uh, 12. So we have 10 in, 10 in the back of the unit that we use for the OS. And, and then we have um, two in the front for, um, for storage. And that, that's about 13 terabytes to start with, uh, excuse me, 12 terabytes to start with. And then you can scale that up out to 31 terabytes in each one of the VSA nodes. The cool thing about the VSA nodes is that uh, the VSA cluster is that if you, if you want, uh, yep, I mean, we have three of them. And so uh, th that's obviously uh, highly available. And you can, you can take those nodes and put them anywhere you want. They don't have to stay in the rack. So you could take one of those nodes and put them in a data center, and they're still part of the cluster. Hardware? What? OK, I'm sorry. OK, so that's, that's the, oh, I didn't even get to the. So for, for Helion OpenStack, the, the OpenStack distro uses five uh, management nodes. And each one of these management nodes is configured specifically for the role that it plays. So we have a seed, a seed cloud host, which um, basically spins up the first VM for the deployment. After that, it's just a DHCP server. Um, it has a couple of other functions, but basically that's what it is. And so uh, we've got a single six core processor in there with 32 gigs. There, and there's no need to, to do any more than that. The, the thing about the way we um, uh, the way we design this is it will, it will run your private cloud and it will scale as far as OpenStack is going to allow you to scale. In other words, uh, we didn't want you to be in a situation. We designed it so that um, our customers would not be in a situation where uh, they, they get to so many VMs or they get to so many compute nodes or so much storage and all of a sudden, um, they're toast and they got to start over or they got to do something else. This, is, this allows you to scale up to what the Helion OpenStack um, distro will allow you to scale. Um, for the undercloud controller, which is used to manage the physical infrastructure, uh, again, this, these, are, these are DL360s. Uh, we use two six core processors because it does a little bit more and, um, and, the, and 64 gig of, of RAM. Uh, and for the overcloud controllers, we have three of those, and that's what manages the, the, the virtual infrastructure. That's your OpenStack management structure. And there's three of them for redundancy. So let me show you what it kind of looks like. This is what it looks like in a rack. We happen to have one in the, Heli in the uh, Helion booth uh, in the marketplace, if you'd like to come by and take a look at it. Um, it it's not a real. Uh, rack, it's a virtual rack, but, um, but it, will, it, will, it gets its point across. So um, this is what it looks like, and, and so you, saw, you see the design, and one of the nice things about it is there's lots of room left over for scale out. Um, and you can see the little bars on the right-hand side, so uh, you, you, know, you can add additional compute nodes, you can add additional uh, object storage. Uh, nodes, you can add additional uh, block storage nodes, and obviously you can't max out every single one of them in the same rack. You, you run out of space. Um, so that's, that's basically what it looks like. 
Uh, for, the, for the networking switches, um, we have a Flex Fabric 5700 switch. Um, the, the 48G is, uh, is a one gig switch and we use that for IPMI traffic only. And then the, the Flex Fabric 5740XG, that's a, uh, those are 10 gig uh, ports and we have two 40 gig ports for north-south traffic to get you out of the rack. Uh, now again, uh, boy, I tell you, we, we, we talked to a lot of customers um, as we went through this and uh, everybody had an opinion and they still do. And, and I know that there's lots of you who are saying, well, why didn't you use blades? Or why didn't you use uh, more dense storage? Or why didn't you use more dense compute? Or why didn't you use this? Or why didn't you do, what about this NIC? And what about that NIC? And what about, and, and the, the key here is we wanted it to be as flexible as possible. So as your work, when, when you start figuring out what your workloads, if it, if it truly turns out that that your workloads are very object centric, object storage centric, then by all means get, get a much more dense storage box for that. Um, but, but, but one, you don't know what you don't know, and two, you, you are going to scale out. So this isn't going to hurt you. This is gonna get you up and running. It's gonna, get, it's gonna allow you to, um, to see what kinds of behaviors your end users will have, and, and it will get you rolling. Okay, so um, a summary of best practices. First, mitigate risk. Use known, reliable hardware. Um, that, that is critical. Uh, it, you, you think about it, uh, in a system like I just showed, as your playing around and getting ready to start deploying real live workloads into production, but your, 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 your end users are, are, are building up, uh, you know, a server failure is, is somewhat catastrophic when you have four nodes. You know, it's not, uh, you, 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 don't wanna, you don't wanna run into those problems because then there's this perception that the OpenStack private cloud doesn't work. And if you do have a problem, you're not really sure exactly where it came from. You know, was it hardware, was it the software, what was it? So use known, reliable hardware. Um, the second is that the physical host should have similar architectures. Uh, again, it, it has to do with ease of management of the hardware. This is, this is your first cloud. This is, this is something that you wanna spend your time um, socializing within your organization, socializing within your IT organization. Um, expect workload variability. In other words, get, get, get servers that are flexible so that you can redeploy them if and when things change, and they will. OpenStack is different than it was last year, which was different than it was, la you know, I mean, it, it, it will change. Plan to scale up and out. Th that's gonna happen. That, that is absolutely gonna happen. Um, you get this thing running, running well, your end users start becoming extremely happy and they quit going to um, fill in the blank public cloud to, uh, to dump your uh, proprietary IP on um, while they're coding and testing, uh, they're, gonna, they're, gonna, they're, they're gonna want more of this. And it, you know, it, it, it goes without saying that your cloud should be highly available. Um, you, you need to really think about making sure that, that you have some redundancy built in. And it's, it was that simple. That was it. Questions? Anybody who has a question that can stump me gets a 16 gig thumb drive. <laughs> sure. You, you can. You, you can use SSDs, they're absolutely not a problem. The, um, the question was, uh, oh, because we, we wanted use on, on the mic. Um, so the question was, why didn't we use SSDs in the design? And, and, and the answer is, we could have. Absolutely we could have. The reason that we didn't was for cost purposes. Um, again, you're, you're gonna stand up and you're gonna start building this thing out. There'll be a time and a place for those SSD drives. Um, but we wanted to make sure that everything was, um, as cost effective as possible 
Um, it goes back to the mitigation of risk and all of this stuff. You're, you're spending a half a million dollars or somewhere in that neighborhood um, to build this thing up and get things rolling. And SSD drives are a bit expensive. So that was fundamentally the reason. So the question was, if you were going to use SSD drives, where would be the best place to put them? Uh, m most likely in the VSA um, cluster. Uh, again, Swift's object storage is, you know, it's usually the uh, digital parking lot, right? You don't, you don't necessarily need high performance. So um, SSDs are very high performing. So did I get it? Oh, you don't get the <laughs> question. Neutron is deployed. I didn't see it in there. That's why I was curious. Oh, Neutron is deployed. Okay. Neutron is deployed, yes. The question was, did we consider Neutron? Yes, it, yes we did, and it is deployed. Why a single TIMD switch? You're not redundant there. That's a very good question. Um, the question is, why, why did we use a single switch? So we have one switch for IPMI and one switch for the management network traffic. We're not redundant. And uh, again, it goes to cost. The, in terms of the product that we sell, the Helion Rack, okay, it was bait and switch. I'm, I'm selling Helion Rack. Um, uh, the, um, it, it comes down to cost. You, you will, a, a, after you're doing your cloud native development and you, you're now starting to do some testing and maybe you're, and maybe you're getting ready to take this cloud and move it into a real live production mode, which is going to, you know, there's, there's a journey there. Could be a month, two months, three months, some, some period of time. Add the switches. Yes, sir. One thing, could you, um, I know that they're, they're going to scream at me. Could you, uh, there's a microphone right there. Um, this is being recorded and... Uh, your voice needs to be saved for posterity. <laughs> Hi. Uh, so a uh, couple of boxes want to uh, make it as the back end on uh, Ionic driver. Uh, so what do you prefer through uh, ILOM or directly Ionic integration in your boxes? I, I, I don't understand what you ask. I'm sorry. You, uh, uh, so a couple of uh, your blades, I want to in, uh, put it as a backend as the Ionic, purely bare metal backend. Okay. Uh, so what do you prefer, go through ILOM or through Ionic? Um, so for management, ILO. Okay. Yes. Yes, sir. So what are the costs that you have developed in your mind before designing this? What kind of price tag that you have? What kind of price tag? Uh, the, the famous... Uh, half a million dollar question um, of the price tag of the of the of the rack. So um, a, a lot of it depends on how you how you configure it and how you sell it. So the the um, not sell it, but how you how you configure it. In in the uh, in the example that that I've shown, the uh, the hardware. There, so you have to think about it in in terms of um, what the hardware is going to cost, and you also need to think about you know what are the software. What's the software going to cost? Um, what are the professional services going to cost as you, as you get this installed? The, 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 the Helion Rack product is, is designed to be come in, set it up, and you're up and running, and, and, and also training. So if you, if you look at all of that, the factory integration, the cabling, the, the shipping all together, the professional services showing up, um, installing the, the product, and getting it up and running, and you're looking at you know 430k. Okay, but that's everything. So you started with one one net, uh, one switch, then you scale, and you can upgrade to a dual switch. And is it that easy to do that from the design? The question is: Is it easy to scale from the networking side of it? Any any network engineers in here? It's never easy to scale networking. I mean, it, it is what it is, right? Um, I think your question more is, you know, plugging in another switch and making, making your system redundant. Without bringing it down. Essentially, I just want to, you know, keep it up going, create a cluster and whatnot. And... I mean, just the fact 
fact that you started with one switch. Right, right. Um, so, I, I mean, you know, cabling up additional um, networking ports that you, you, you will have to bring down the, the servers that you do. You don't, they're, they're not HUD plug network um, ports. You did not mention the. Uh, you, did, you did not mention the number of um, network interfaces for each of those nodes. Do you have any idea what they were? So especially, for the. Um, especially for for the controller nodes. It, especially for the which nodes. For the controller. Controller. The controller nodes. So the controller nodes have. Um, we have one gig ports from the ILO. So we use ILO. In, in HP ProLiant server, so we have that's what we use for our management. So we have one gig ports going from the ILO port into the uh, um, into the 5700, which is a which is a one gig uh, port switch. Um, 40, 40 ports in that, and then for the management of the of the OpenStack uh, private cloud itself, we have 10 gig ports. So we have a single, and, and begin because there's only a, there's only a single. Uh, because there is a single 10 gig switch, we have one, one of the uh, 10 gig ports to that switch. So the controller has just one or two could, ports? Could, so each node in the controller plane has two ports. Oh, okay. One of them is a one gig for, for management of the hardware. So powering on, powering off, those types of things, oh, hardware okay. management. And then the 10 gig port is used for OpenStack management. I see. So that's for managing it. the OpenStack services. Okay. D did that so, answer your question? Yeah, because uh, you know when I look at the documentation, right, they're showing like two to three networking interfaces just for OpenStack. Like they have you know internal network and external network and uh, data network and so on. So yeah, this is the this is the physical. I mean, you you have a service network running underneath there. I mean, so there there are several there are a couple of virtual networks running at the same time over the top of the physical network. I think that's what you're asking. Yeah. Well, could they be separate, right? I mean, could, could you have one-to-one -one relationship? You could. Not, not use VLANs, let's say. Right? Then you need distinct networking interfaces if you're not planning to use the VLANs or virtual networking. See, with the single interface, right, you're sharing it with, especially like when you want to do this VXLANs per tenant and stuff. Okay. So, so, so yeah. um, so the, the 5700 switch doesn't support VXLAN. Um, so if you, wanna, if you want VXLAN in your, in your um, private cloud, then you would, um, they, then you would use our uh, 5930. I mean, the, 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 the thing about this design is obviously there are, some, there are some configuration changes that you can do. So we have a 5730 switch, flex fabric switch that supports VXLAN. You would you would use that switch, and then you would also swap out the NICs. You would want a you would you would want a NIC that could support VXLAN. Right. So, you know, we we in in the base unit that we sell, we use a an, an Intel dual port 10 gig NIC. Uh, if you wanted to use VXLAN, then you could use you know a Mellanox NIC that right. supports okay. offloading. I think they split okay. it up so. between their under cloud and their over cloud, and they divided up the services there. And you would guess right. <laughs> Whoops. My Houston Astros are doing well, but I'm not on that team. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Here you go. I, I <laughs> The question was, how many kilowatts does a rack take? I, I'm sorry, I, I don't know that answer. <laughs> Whoops, I have one more. It's, it's pretty easy to stump me. Like I said, I'm in marketing. But you have to catch the lie. That's the, the key. Pardon? If it's not HP, what is my recommendation? If, it, if what's not HP? If, if what is not HP? Oh, in the hardware stack. Um, hmm, that's a, that's a good question. 
I, I think my answer is, wh why would you even <laughs> consider? I mean, so, it, yeah, I, I mean, I, so your question's well, well taken, and, and the, the DL360 and the DL380 are the most popular servers on the planet. I mean, they are. I mean, uh, we have a huge uh, share of that market. And so that was one of the reasons why we chose them, because uh, when it's all said and done, and you're trying to build your private cloud, and you're standing there with your badge in front of your CIO, and your CIO goes, I don't know about spending half a million dollars on this, you can look at them right in the eye and say, you know what, if this, if this thing goes horribly wrong, I have a rack of DL360 and 380 servers. How bad, that, how bad can that be? So, pardon? No one's ever going to get fired for buying HP. No one's going to get fired for buying HP. Oh, the question, uh, the statement was nobody's going to get fired for buying HP. I didn't say it. <laughs> does, does the design support sharing ILO over the 10U? I don't know. You guys are saying no? No. No. Do you guys know for sure? It's, it's, yeah, ILO's one gig only. Okay. No. The answer is no. No more questions? Oh, I didn't know that answer. Here you go. This is the last one. And oh, by the way, there's stuff on these, um, but it's 16 gig. So you don't have to erase it. You could actually look at it at some point. <laughs> okay, thank you.